Welcome to the RAN CRE Show. Commercial real estate with no stone left unturned. Hey everyone, welcome to the RAN CRE Show. I'm your host, Mike Taravella, and today I am super excited to have our guest, Ryan Gibson. He's the Chief Investing Officer of the Spartan Investment Group. And Ryan and his team, Ryan has been in charge of 30 million in private equity uh, projects for Spartan. Welcome to the show, Ryan. How, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah. You know, we were talking on the pod before the podcast, uh, just getting to know each other a little bit more. And just uh, Ryan would love to kind of hear more about what Spartan's core, like what does Spartan do? How do they like the three unique selling propositions that we talked about before? Because I think it's just super important to kind of understand what Spartan Spartan does. Yeah, I think what's unique is that we can build stuff from the ground up. Uh, we can also buy existing assets. What cash. assets, for those who don't know, like what assets are you primarily focused in on? Yeah, self-storage is our primary focus. So if you look at our portfolio, you'll see a couple of RV parks and you'll see a brand new mobile home park. And I know those don't typically exist, but <laughs> we actually have a brand new mobile home park. We're building 217 lots. And not only are we building a new mobile home park right now, but it's in one of the most beautiful parts of Washington state out in the Olympic Peninsula, 30 minutes from Olympic National Park. So it's a very REIT worthy asset. Uh, it has utilities, city utilities, mountain views, high rents, um, high cost of uh, manufactured homes. So, but our, our primary thesis is in, to invest in self-storage. And we have uh, just over a million square feet of self-storage, uh, about 20 facilities spread across uh, five states. And we're currently buying portfolios of storage. So we have a portfolio of nine storages that we're bringing on uh, this quarter. We also have another portfolio of three storages. And we're going to be, I believe, in about 10 states pretty soon, um, spread across the, uh, the different assets and um, just shy of 40 storages by the end of the year. So uh, we're rapidly growing. We were the uh, Inc. 500 fastest growing companies uh, in 2020. So we were- Congratulations. Ranked- Thanks. Yeah. Because yeah. growth, growth is not easy, especially I think in real estate, it gets simplified of, well, you're just buying more units. And I think with your group, it's a lot harder, especially from five to 10 states. It's not like you can just drive down the block and get another, you know, reviewing them. So I think that commends to your growth and growing responsibly. Yeah. You know, our growth is in people. So we're actually growing our staff to handle the workload. So, you know, we were talking earlier about We do the construction, the property and asset management. We also do all the acquisitions and capital raising all within Spartan. So we take on retail investors and we do the whole value chain. So um, like we're GCing a project, like we dispatch a W2 employee from Spartan to oversight the construction of our facilities. So, uh, you know, our growth has been focused on making sure we have the resources uh, to handle the projects that we have coming in. And, you know, we, we do a strategic plan every three years. Our strategic plan is actually on our website and you can download our strategic plan and see how, how we've mapped out three years. What's great is we're actually completing our strategic plan a year early. It's supposed to end in 2022. We'll have everything completed by the end of 2021 and actually exceed it a little bit. And the reason why is because when we started our strategic plan a couple of years ago, because we do one every three years, we didn't factor in what would happen when you added 40 people to your company. (laughs) A lot more gets done. (laughs) So that's always a good thing, right? I'm just, yeah. The band, I think when you're doing those planning, you're like, man, what can we do in three years? And like you said, when you get 40 new people, you're like, Oh wow, this can, it can go one of two ways. It can get a lot easier, a lot harder. And I think that commends on the systems that Spartan investment group has brought on and succeeded in. Yeah. And the thing that I always like to talk about too is, um, you know, when people are like, Hey, you're raising your own capital for projects. Are you ever going to not take investor capital and just use the money that you make from projects to do your own deals? And the answer to that is always absolutely not. We're always going to be a capital raising company because of what you can do when you reinvest, when you reinvest your profits from deals into your company and your people, now you can do 10 times, 20 times what you've done previously, where if you're just doing your own deals, you're going to only just be able to do your own deals. And I think that is why syndication is such a great tool uh, to build your business and to um, have more um, assets come into your uh, 
uh, company and, and really kind of be able to handle more projects uh, without losing your head. Right. Cause I mean, we, you know, there, there'd be no way I could do what we do without our team. And um, you know, and it's amazing if, you know, our focus really over the last 18 months or two years, three years, you know, we've been in business since 2014 has been, you know, the people we hire, we spend so much time hiring the right person. And that, that really uh, has built an, a tremendous team, especially the first people you hire are so critical to the overall culture and success. And what, what's different is, you know, we still have an emphasis on face-to-face. So we still have physical, op- we you know, we've always had a physical office, um, you know, once we got the appropriate staffing and we, we uh, require employees to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we do a midweek in person, and then we allow people to work remotely on Mondays and Fridays. And when you're a company growing as fast as we are, if you don't have that face-to-face, uh, you, you know, you could still grow. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it really has helped us grow well is having the, the face-to-face interaction. So. No, that's, I think that's great because I think cha- testing those norms of investing in the people, I think what, I think having that three-year vision, right. Of we're going this way. And I think I always resorted back to like traction or uh, the other books of like, if you're not going in this direction, the, the outliers for better or for worse stick out of like, oh, they're bought into this vision or they're not. But also too, you mentioned the investing and allowing the flexibility of not necessarily being super rigid of, oh, hey, you need to be here five days a week, nine to five. Like in real estate, we all know that, hey, you might get a call late Friday, you're touring a property Saturday and you're submitting an offer on Sunday. So like there's, there's so many different dynamics with real estate, but I think it's awesome that uh, you allow your team the flexibility, you're investing in your team members and, you know, keeping that in person. I know that's the toughest part, especially with 2020, what it was, uh, the world was supposed to end. But I think just having that, uh, that awareness piece to do all of those things, investing in your people is a huge dynamic piece that allows you to grow as quickly as you guys have done. Yeah, I think another thing that really helps uh, sync a team, if, you're, if you are remote or in person, we do a weekly sync call on Wednesdays at two Pacific time. And it's our entire company to get on a call. And we have an agenda of what we go, go through. And everybody just kind of says, you know, uh, like for, inve- for example, investor relations reports on how many engagements we had last week, how many intakes that we've had, upcoming uh, key engagements and podcasts that we've been on, et cetera. Kind of let the kind of let the company know like what IR is up to, you know, upcoming raises that we have going on. You know, the construction team does an around the room and how like a, a high level and how all the projects are going. Um, and any uh, discussion that gets sort of, oh yeah, oh, that's right. You know, hey, let's take that offline and meet later. Uh, that kind of stuff happens and it really gets our team coordinated so everybody knows the mission, vision, values. And that's another thing we actually review the mission, vision, values at the beginning of every sync call every week. And we ask our employees, how have we met the mission this week? And we ask for specific examples um, of our values and how they've been uh, implemented. And then what we've done as an organization to achieve the mission, which is to improve lives through real estate. That's that's awesome. Yeah, we do a weekly huddle every week and we read out the core values and our purpose and our company. Like, Because with RAND, we have our property management division, we have our investing and our education platform. So it's cool to just we might, we might not be as together on the day-to-day, but we're still meeting up and kind of have a quick view of how things are going. But I think that's great because how you guys are doing it, you're seeing that you're constantly evaluating yourself to see, are we hitting the mission? Are we abiding by our core values? Because I think with a lot of startups, they, I think people think the core values and the vision is like too pie in the sky. But I think that's the only thing that you see grow consistently. And even myself, if I'm not writing down my goals, uh, right. it's the word. It's just like, I'm kind of walking. I don't feel like any progress. And even like my first real estate deal was like, I'm going to do a $5 million deal. And then four months later, we did it. I joined Rand and we did a $10 million one. So it's just like, once you write it down, it become real. And then just like taking that course of action every single day to get there. And that's just the coolest part. And like you said, you've grown over 40 people and got there a year earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cool because now and the other part too, is uh, we got a business coach and a business coach helps you um, kind of frame, put the framework or the, the operating system into your uh, business and having a business coach, you know, try to help you kind of boil up the, the most important things 
and then hold you accountable to those things uh, through uh, regular check-ins, I think has been pretty valuable too. So we're really looking forward to our, our next uh, quarterly offsite session. We do quarterly offsite with our executive team um, is in June and we're gonna plan on what the next version of the strategic plan is gonna look like since we're buttoning it up uh, a year early, so. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, yeah, because you think when you do those planning sessions, if you do them in the office, but uh, I found in my, you do your best thinking when you're away and just looking uh, at the future and just kind of like reassessing. So it's just always interesting to see. So I, and we, we've done Petra and that's been a huge uh, work with our business. And, you know, if, if you're developing, working on the business versus in it, it allows you to grow 10 X or hundred X because then you're having the people in the business, like pointing that vision, they have more buy-in uh, they can mold. And like for our, our accounting team, we've gotten uh, we're looking to add one more team member. And, but because we've talked to our, our one accountant, it's having that bigger mindset of what's going on versus kind of just pay the bills, do these things. And it's like, no, no, we're trying to do yeah. much bigger stuff in the future. You know, that, that's interesting that, you know, you may, you kind of made me think of something where, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about working on the business, you don't have, you won't have a deal problem or an investor problem or a operations problem. When you're working on the business, you'll be able to solve all those problems by working on the business rather than working in the business. So for the longest time, when we were a small team and didn't have much of a business, we had a deal flow problem. You know, when we, when we, you know, then, then we had an ops problem and this and that. So now, um, you know, really now that we're, you know, we have a, a, a staff of five acquisitions uh, associates that, that work full time uh, deal finding. And we have a structure around that. We have a compensation structure around that. Uh, our deal flow has been great. And, uh, you know, and it's not because we're buying more expensive assets or are or, or willing to pay more, or being more competitive. It's just we're, we're in front of more people. And because we have the the system to play to play in that, and we've used the proceeds from investments and and fees to fund the the staff of our, that we have at Spartan. So, you know, talk about delayed gratification. You know, delayed salaries, delayed payoffs. You know, to get the team and the support and the infrastructure so that you can really create something that's uh, capable of doing a lot of uh, output. Yeah. Building- and that- Oh, but I was just going to say, that's like the biggest, uh, I think when you, when you're such a small team, you have to do everything. So it's just running around, putting out fires left and right. But now that you have the infrastructure and the process, I, I always think of like my favorite books that I've read is like, uh, Ray Dalio's principles and just him is like, if you're not getting the result, you have to look down at the machine. And if you're, I think when every new business starts off is the, the founder is doing everything, and then there's not that pass down because of, it could be trust, it could be, you know, not right teach. You know, there's so many different aspects, but as you delegate that down, you're investing in that person to execute that, that job, that task, that, that progress or project. So then uh, it's that true delegation of it. And so I think it's whatever hurdle you as the entrepreneur may have, but as you grow in scale, it's just, you realize you're investing in people. And that's like the coolest part of, who would have thought since 2014 that you have five acquisitions, people investing in 10 States and they're raising money and developing. Like, I don't think, you know, from 2014 to now, I'm sure that strategic plan looks a lot different, but. Uh, it does. And yeah. It's amazing. Like, you know, I know there's like the BHAG from uh, principles, you know, the big hairy audacious goal, you know, and you kind of do your moonshot. Right. And the strategic plan kind of feels like that. Sometimes where we're like, we're going to raise, you know, a hundred million this year. And it's like, okay. And then, you know, you know, we're going to have this many deals and, you know, you're kind of like, I have 10 employees. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, man, it's like, I mean, we're raising $80 million in quarter two of this year. Um, it's a good number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like, wow. You know, it's, uh, it's cool, you know, and, um, and, and when these things start happening, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty rewarding, pretty exciting. And, the thing I was going to add on to that is, you know, our over the last year, I've been focused on replacing myself in every aspect of the business and my quarterly rock. You know, it sounds like you're you're subscribing to the to the traction model, a rock, you know, being for those who haven't listened to the book, it's, you know, you have a bucket. You can only put so much stuff in your bucket, you know, and you got the sand and the little pebbles and the stones that fill up all the gaps. But you have your big rock 
that goes in there first. And that's the thing that you want to get done. So my, my quarterly uh, rock last quarter was to completely uh, SOP everything, like everything. Like when investor money gets received, there's an eight step process for what happens. And, um, and it's not because it's overcomplicated. It's just because, you know, you got to put them up in the communication. You got to put them in the cap table. You got to put them in the QuickBooks. You got to put them in here. You got to put them there. So, and, you know, just doing that. So I don't have to be looking over anybody's shoulder, you know, um, what's also cool is we did a, a Udemy training course. So we filmed about two hours of content professionally high quality. So we, you know, we're onboarding a new employee about once a week on average, so, you know, they can sit and watch a, you know, what guided with a real person, but an overview of our company in a very professional way really sets the tone uh, so that you, so you can scale the training of employees um, or augment uh, some of the things that you already do. So that's been, you know, something that we rolled out um, that, that it's been really effective. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I always laugh because uh, my, my colleagues will always go, Mike is good at finding out how to do things once and then try to figure out how to never do them again. <laughs> I'm jealous of you because I have a problem of not letting go. Um, and, and I've really tried to force myself. I'm like, all right, you got a team, like give it to the team. There's three people that work in IR now. You've got to delegate what you're doing because if you're just continuing to do it, you know, you cannot, like I have to think my, my biggest challenge is I have to, I always have to stay strategic. You know, I love, you know, I'm the problem. One of my faults is I have a lot of skills. You know, I can make a video, I can do content, I can film it, I can record it. I know what to, to do with how to build an offering memorandum, how to build dot like loan docs and offering docs. Right. So I, I, you know, but it's like, no, 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 that's not what you're, you know, you need to be strategic so that your employees are going to get well-paid, well recruit, you know, recruit good people. And, you know, you're, we're focusing on truly the highest and best value. It's funny, like talking to investors is a lot of people's highest and best value. And in our case, it's not for me. Um, it was for a while, but it's not anymore because there's, you know, when you have a business that's going to have a hundred employees by the end of this year, your highest and best value is not talking to all your investors. It's not, I mean, it's still part of what I do, a, a big part of what I do, but I encourage people to think about finding people who can do that just as well or better uh, in some cases than you are. So I just want to add a side note, dear investors, you are very important to both Ryan and ours business. We just want to caveat that very much. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not only that, they are the most important part of the business, <laughs> but, but even more important is for my investors to know that um, the reason why maybe I not, might not be talking to somebody is because, or delegating that is because I am trying to make sure that the ball is moving forward on more important things that impact their investments. So, exactly. um, yeah, very important stuff. No, I, and that's, I think when even thinking about the real estate aspect, it's what is your highest and best use of time? And I think people try to overcomplicate it of doing like the lives and stuff like that. You know, one-on-one -on -one investor calls are important because you need to know who your investor base is because not every investor may have the same goals as you and that's okay. But as you grow and scale, like you said, you have 40 employees, it's, well, now with Ryan, how does Ryan talk to everyone, a large group of people? Because instead of having that one-on-one, -on -one, you could be out making content, like you said, being strategic of how do we reduce this pain point? And you're looking at your machine full time. So uh, it's, a, it's always an interesting piece when you look at it, especially with the world of virtual assistants and stuff like that. And plus you have a team of already 40 plus people and trying to get to 100 doubling that and just maintaining culture is going to, is a, it's hard enough. So it's, uh, it's cool to see how quickly you're growing and your team is growing. And especially with $80 million in a quarter, uh, look forward to checking in next quarter to see if it hit the, the hundred million mark. Yeah. Let's, let's do a follow-up. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. We'll do, a, we'll do the post strategic plan. We're like, we did it in six months. We're on to the next one. We're just going <laughs> through, but I, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear kind of more, you know, with it's great talking the strategic, but I think what is Spartan's and uh, Spartan's investing thesis moving forward, yep. especially because in the world that we're in and uh, self storage, we don't have that many people talk about it. We'd love to kind of hear what is your guys' investing thesis. Yeah. So, first of all, I think the number one question, because I'll probably a lot of multifamily listeners is okay, in multifamily, you buy a 300 unit building, you take 100 units offline, you have below market rents, 
you renovate those units, you put them back online for market or above, and that's how you move the NOI. And then, you know, you move the rent on all the units at, over time, you get the cap rate, divide by the cap rate, boom, there's your valuation, there's your cash flow along the way, right? That's kind of how multifamily works. Just an aside real quick, storage, very similar, mostly mom and pop owners, no online sales, no call centers, no SEO, no marketing, no sophisticated operating uh, plan, and they don't have deep pockets like we do. Um, so they can't reposition their asset to be a competitor, maybe a C-class to a B-class or whatever. So we buy the under market value asset. We completely streamline the operations. We get the capital stack real nice and we can uh, you know, produce cash flow and um, add a lot of value. We also build additional units. So we'll, you know, the, actually the facility right behind me on my wall here, uh, nine buildings, we just added two buildings to it, uh, two acres. Um, so we added 240 units um, or about $300,000 a year in NOI. I say 200 plus unit add on is always a nice little value piece. Like, oh, by the way, yeah. we can do all these things plus <laughs> add more. <laughs> yeah, we're cash on cash. Uh, we do our distributions monthly. Cash on cash is about uh, 10% for a while, it's 12%. While we were going through the construction, and then now that we have the new units online and they, as they start to lease up, it, it just it's gravy on top. So we can, we can derive a lot of value from adding on additional units. Um, so so anyway, so our thesis is, or so our, so our underwriting is to sell to a mom and pop owner. So it's, or to another group like ours or another uh, guy who's doing a 1031 exchange and they want to, they just want to place capital into something that's stabilized. So we take the unstable asset, uh, get the cash flow up, you know, sell it uh, to a, to a one-on-one. -on -one. That's how we underwrite. But the reality is the industry um, wants to place institutional REIT, uh, where the, uh, you know, REIT companies want to place hundreds of millions, sometimes billions into self-storage assets. And they don't want to buy your $5 million facility in south of Dallas or in a tertiary market. They want to buy, um, you know, in a second, they want to buy a portfolio of, um, you know, 50,000 plus uh, square foot assets uh, comprising of a 250, maybe even a $500 million portfolio. They want to write one check and buy them all. So if you look at simply self-storage in Q4 of 2020, uh, the Blackstone came in, picked up simply self-storage for 1.2 billion. Uh, if you look at the recent acquisition on uh, Q1 of 2021, uh, public storage, they bought the easy storage brand in Virginia, Maryland, and New York for 1.7 billion. And so the industry is rapidly consolidating through the, the, the big grab of a lot of assets. So what we've done, um, we haven't changed our underwriting. Our underwriting is still to just do single asset sales to, you know, to one on one. Um, but we, what we've considered is that when you sell a five hundred million dollar portfolio to a bigger fund, you're going to get cap rate compression, and you're going to get you're going to get a uh, hundred to hundred and fifty basis point cap rate compression. It's considerable. So instead of selling a five million dollar asset to a one on one, you might be getting six and a half seven million dollars for that same asset if it's rolled up into a bigger portfolio. So our strategy pivoted late last year, we rolled out our national brand free up storage and all of our facilities are being rebranded um, in 2021 and all of our, our future acquisitions are going to 2021 are gonna be in the free up brand. And what we've done is we've rolled out a whole brand standards policy book, um, you know, capital improvements, brand standards, what the offices look like, how the desks are laid out, how the call centers are. So you walk into a free up storage facility and you have an expectation of what the hours are, the gate access, what we offer, stationary, everything is the same. So if uh, you know if a, somebody wanted to come in and buy our $500 million portfolio, they could write a check and they know what they're getting. So um, we've really put a lot of emphasis on free up um, as, a, as a brand that, that flags our self storage business. No different than how like a store quest started um, or any of the other nationally traded, um, you know, REITs that uh, are in the space. So we're in buy mode right now. Uh, we are acquiring 24 facilities in 2021, and we're we're about halfway through our goal. It's uh, May, so we're about almost at the halfway mark, and we've uh, picked up about 14 or 12 assets uh, so far this year. And, uh, you know, we don't see ourselves slowing down and we're also building, we have about 3000 units that we're building right now, uh, spread across Texas, Colorado, and Washington. 
Arkansas and Georgia. Uh, and pretty soon we're going to be building uh, storage and some even industrial in, um, in Florida. And then we have one property in Tennessee. So we're, you know, we're, we're growing the brand. Um, and we, we're also expanding into Madison, Wisconsin uh, this quarter. So we're growing the, go, growing the brand and, and, and quality of assets uh, that we have within that portfolio. And we're starting to kind of look at less smaller facilities and we're starting to focus on the facilities like we're buying and um, we're buying a portfolio of three facilities in Madison this quarter, you know, 120,000 square feet and a class A property, you know, um, and that's kind of the, you know, when you look through somebody's portfolio, you know, you kind of see the duds and you kind of got to deal with those, but you know, then you've got the, you know, you I mean, got they're the not all perfect on the portfolio <laughs> buys. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. We're buying a nine property portfolio right now. And, um, I mean, there's some gems in there, but there's some, you know, there's some properties that they're good. They, they IRR standalone very well, but you know, you look at them and you're kind of like, man, I wish I didn't have to buy that one, but we can, but we can work with it. You know, we can work with it. We can make it a contributor and a fighter in the portfolio and who knows, maybe it'll perform a little better than we think. Um, but yeah, you're, you're picking up some assets that may not be that great. One property, we can add a hundred thousand square feet of storage to it and we can double the industrial space. Um, and what's great is Spartan is a, we're, a, we're a GC. So we're, we're building, uh, we're, we're already plant laying out a site plan to build industrial, uh, flex space onto the site. And, um, you know, we can build everything from a mobile home park to, uh, to, a you know, a multi-story class, a, you know, climate controlled storage facility in an urban downtown area. We can, we can do it all. Um, so I think that's what I love about our team is, you know, there is no question about our property management skills in any market. We're all over the place. We do our own property management. You, you're probably very familiar with that model. Um, so we're not, we're not scared of that or we're not scared of building. So I think that's, that's kind of what, what's fun about it. Yeah. I love how when discussing the thesis, you started with the end in mind. And I think a lot of investors like, well, they're starting off is just get a deal and then figure out this. It, it's the end in mind of who you want to sell to, because that, I think, to, you know, it's not saying poo-poo to the smaller deals. I think it's just when you first started in 2014, it was, hey, let's get a deal. Then we can figure it out and learn as we grow. But now it, now that the, the underwriting hasn't changed in the sense of who we're selling to, but the vision has changed of let's go more institutional. And then that has changed in the sense of how to get, how do we sell to an institution? So it's not buying the 20, you know, the smaller stuff. It's just, this does not fit our box. And I, as you scale a company, it's not like we all start from somewhere. So it's just, it's cool to see starting with the end in mind. And I think, like you said, because your, your team is so dynamic and has the bandwidth and the, the know of how to develop and how to do this. And uh, one, one resource I would recommend just because you're growing so quickly, uh, so working with Dan Gilbert, he, he has an onboarding every Monday for new employees because he has, I think it was like 26 companies and they call it the family of companies. And he has like a isms book. So all of their team's core values and the stories behind it. So I think it's just like growing that vision and I can talk to you offline, but it was just cool to see kind of every Monday, everyone knows it's the new people. So when they're doing the office tours and discussing people, it's just kind of like, no, we're growing, we're growing quick and we're abiding by the culture. Uh, it's just cool to see. So uh, I'll talk to you. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's probably the, one of my fondest memories of this year so far is we actually had a Monday class of four new employees that's and awesome. um, yeah, like four, four new Spartans starting on the same day. And so we did our, um, you know, kind of our introductory videos on an orientation course. And, uh, you know, we had it led by, you know, one of the executive uh, team members, but it was cool. It was like, wow, this is really efficient. We're, we're training four new employees, you know, in the same week in the same footprint and everybody's, you know, there's com some bonding and camaraderie that goes on with that. Um, and so, and a lot of efficiency. So, um, you know, it's definitely something that is, uh, is exciting. I, I, I'll check it out the, on the isms. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's it's just that camaraderie too. Of we started together, and you're not like, are you new? How long have you been here? Yeah. Like it's just like a, we're this this class and running through it, and um, you never know who you just connect with and resonate. And you could be in different departments, but you're like, hey, let's figure this out together. So um, yeah, we, it's, also, we also do mentorship Mondays. I think once a month we just awesome. have. Yeah, it's like open. It's like open time with the executive team. 
Because a lot of people that come work for us um, hear about us like on Bigger Pockets or they are very passionate about real estate investing and they really just want to get into a company and, and grow. Um, and uh, we have a lot of people that, you know, are, I mean, we've sent people back to college to learn about construction project management. Uh, you know, Garrett, I think is a great example that um, Garrett's our CPM. He's, you know, he was working for IBM. He heard us on bigger pockets. He came, he applied, uh, we hired him on the spot and uh, you know, he's, he's building a, he's building a hundred units right now in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, and he got to uh, blow up dynamite to bust up some of the granite and rock. Uh, and he's building, you know, thousands of units uh, across the country. He's building our mobile home park. He's, you know, had a hand in our 750 unit uh, new build in Seattle, just south of Seattle. Um, he's doing our Texas projects. I mean, he is, he is getting consumed in real estate uh, development. And, uh, and it's cool because, you know, I think w one other thing I'm really passionate about is it's a great place for a bunch of entrepreneurs to come and work um, as entrepreneurs uh, with the scaffolding place uh, to just learn a ton. And, uh, you know, we're doing everything from private lending and we, we have private investors that lend, um, you know, to keep our capital stack flexible and our projects moving and private equity. And, and we're so transparent that people can learn just so much about the real estate world uh, working in our space. So it makes it really fun. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, the entrepreneur piece, because when you start off in real estate, there's a lot of groups that are smaller and you get to do a lot of different things. And I think uh, Naval Ravikant, his, his big advice for people who are looking to start is join a small group because you do so many different things that you find your niche. Like I started in public accounting, seeing all different aspects, but then I worked with startups and I was like, okay, this is great building this skill set. And then I realized I was like, I actually want to do real estate. So just taking those skill sets because uh, every accountant, they're like, it's a great skill set. And then when you're trying to get the next piece, it's like, well, how do I get out of accounting? So uh, yeah. that's that entrepreneur piece is such an underrated skill. So you don't have to be the CEO or the founder. Like you could be a number yeah. two, a number three, a number 10 and get very well compensated in building that group. So don't. And, and we, we offer employee ownership. So, you know, you could be building something that you own. So it's, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. And we also do discounted investing shares uh, into projects and, you know, a bunch of different benefits that, you know, we want alignment, you know, we, we want you to care about the project just as much as we do. So, um, you know, it's something that we really promote. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So Ryan, I appreciate coming on and providing a ton of value. Uh, I think I think I might know the investor pro tip, but what is your one investor pro tip when it comes to our listeners when uh, it comes to investing? As a passive investor, I would not swing at the first pitch. And I would, you know, if you, if you get a deal that comes in front of you, I wouldn't make a decision to do a deal based on the deal that's in front of you. I'd make a decision to do a deal based on the team that backs that that um, um, that that investment. I've invested in over 10 private placements. And I will tell you the best ones have the best teams and the worst ones have the worst teams. And some of the deals that um, most of the deals project the same returns, I would not look at returns or splits. Uh, just just my preference, I would look at the capabilities of the person behind the deal and, and go on a fact finding mission to make sure whatever they tell you is true. Um, and learn as much about the operator as possible before actually doing a deal. Yeah, it's, so. it's, it's a, a discounted like probability of will this deal be successful and just like you said, they're all going to be the same, but how probable is this team going to execute? And like you said, there are a lot of similar returns out there, but I think it's, you know, a good piece of advice, even like on the active side, how many times like that first at bat calling in a broker, uh, they're like, you got to offer this by like Friday and it's Thursday and you're looking at it and then they're just like, all right, usually it. the first deal is the worst one. So you just right. <laughs> say no more often. <laughs> Yeah, so. we look at about 1,200 deals a year. Uh, you That's know, a good so, number. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and not just look. I mean, like we pull out the underwriting, we do some analysis. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we close about not, well, last year we closed nine new projects. So, um, you know, the get get your, get get uh, to saying no. And, and uh, you know, we always look to try to kill a deal more than we do to try to do a deal. Um, and it's amazing. Your deal flow will show up when you kind of refine your, your investment thesis you'll, you'll have a very clear vision about, yep, that makes sense. No, that doesn't make sense. And so the deal vetting process just goes that much faster. 
So yeah, especially because you're not at a point where I need to do a deal or it's my first deal. It's like, no, we've done enough of these where we know it's the mental model of seeing this deal. Hey, when we do deals like this, that's when it goes wrong or not as well as we thought, or if we go in this. So you've seen enough deals where you like kind of have your buckets of like the problem childs and the, the good kids. So it's, it's good to see. The first two years of self-storage investing was the most frustrating time ever because we didn't find anything we wanted to do. We were self-storage investors, but we hadn't bought anything yet. Um, and we were so desperate, not desperate to do a deal, but we, you know, we were desperate to find the right deal. And, uh, you know, but now, now that it's like, you know, you do a first, first few, now I could care less. I mean, if we, if we do or do, don't do a deal, I don't really care. Um, you know, we've, we've got enough pipeline, we've got enough uh, stuff in our portfolio. You know, we're hungry, but we're not hungry to do something bad. So yeah, no, that's yeah. 2020, I felt like it was like a white knuckling year of just like, come on, let's get a deal. And like, calling owners, calling brokers, underwriting stuff was like off a couple of times, but uh, I wrote like deals will come easy to me. And sure enough, we've already done a couple of deals this year. And it's just like, oh, wow. Like it's when you, when you're like, keep it open, but not like for like uh, pressing good stuff happens. So it'll, your time will come and good stuff will happen. But Ryan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. If the listener had any questions about any anything we've talked about self-storage developing it anything how can they reach out to you yeah you could uh hit us up on our website spartan-investors.com or you can email me at ryan r-y-a-n at spartan-investors.com i'm also on linkedin you know if you want to just google ryan gibson uh, spartan investment group i'm on linkedin as well so Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for being on the podcast. I'm definitely going to follow up to see how the, the strategic plan works and see if you're at hit hundred million next quarter. So uh, if you have any questions for myself uh, or uh, about us, info at rancery.com. And until then, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Mike.